Hello for the second uh, evening of the Crusades. Um, I'm Sally Vaughn, and uh, this tonight we'll be having lectures uh, three and four of the class on the Crusades. Um, uh, we, we have a few people wandering in right now. Um, I wanted to start out by maybe um, uh, talking about the reading that we had. Uh, I gave you a pretty hefty reading assignment. I don't think I actually realized how heavy it was until I did it myself. So <laughs> luckily we have a little bit of slack in the syllabus. Um, I, I want to talk about the syllabus for just a moment. I'm going to take up a little bit of that slack, first of all, because I discovered that I forgot to um, put in the reading assignments for this book, The Arab Historians of the Crusades, and this book is actually going to go through the entire class, so we'll read little bits of it here and there as it corresponds to each of the different crusades. We'll be reading the Western view and the, and the Eastern view of each of the crusades to the Holy Land. Um, and so I'm going to uh, post it on the website, the reading assignments. I've got them right here. If you can see the yellow highlighted ones, I've, I've spread it out here. Next week you're going to read a bit of it and then just short assignments going through till the end of the course um, on the Gabrielli. I've, I'm calling it Gabrielli and I will post that on the website, the corrections and the reading assignments for that. So don't try to write it all down. Okay, for today, you read, um, oh, let me ask you, uh, how are you uh, accessing the website? Everybody, is everybody able to access the website with no problem? Anybody having a problem accessing the website? You found it, and you, you found the syllabus. Okay, this morning I posted the notes for tonight's lecture. Uh, I, called, I called it lecture two and lecture four uh, by mistake. So it's really lecture three and lecture four, <laughs> but they're labeled lecture two and lecture four. Uh, I also posted a list of new books. I had time this week to go through all my book catalogs that I picked up at a conference uh, early this spring, and, and I have catalogs from all the publishers. And uh, there's just a ton of books on the Crusades that have come out, and uh, two pages of single-spaced uh, books. So that's posted on the website. If you're looking for books, to do your research paper. Some of you wanted to do um, the Jews in the Crusades. There are at least two new books on the Jews that have come out. So somebody wanted to do Medieval Spain. There's a new book that's out on the Crusade, The Reconquest of Spain, and a lot of other really interesting books, uh, including some primary sources that have been newly translated. Um, so be sure to take a look at that. Also, Joni, as she promised, put a list of journals and um, uh, she was extremely thorough in this list of journals. Uh, some of them you may not be able to get. <laughs> but it's a wonderful list that, that, that covers the entire Middle Ages. So um, uh, they're not all in our library, but uh, uh, she has a very thorough list of journals there. I also am teaching a graduate class at the very same time I'm teaching this undergraduate class, and I will be posting from time to time the bibliographies that I'm making for my graduate students, and on those will be a lot of articles that, uh, that might be useful to you. So I'll be posting those too. I mean, it, it just depends on how much time I have. Okay, since I gave you this um, huge reading assignment this week, I'm going to talk about um, uh, the First Crusade, the reading assignment in that, uh, in the second half of the lecture. The first half I want to talk about the Christopher Tyreman, the invention of the Crusades. H how did you all get along with that book? It, it was different than I thought it would be. How did you all like it? Yeah. Um, I, I enjoyed reading through the first section of it. It sound, um, sounded a whole lot more philosophical um, than I was, I was expecting it to be, albeit the language was rather tedious. Uh, yes, okay. It was a, it was a little bit uh, of a difficult book. Um, uh, I, ex I expected him to do something sort of different with it, but uh, he, he didn't, so that's okay. Anybody else have any comments about this book? Did you have a hard time with it? Was it difficult or was it easy to follow? It certainly gave you an overview of all the Crusades. Any comments? Um. Um, 
person's that, that I was just not familiar with, and I, I would have to reread and reread to. Yeah, understand. yeah. Uh, okay. Can you continue to hold the microphone down while you're talking, please? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. You 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 said you had to reread it and reread it. Okay. Now now look. Don't try to memorize all these names. I will be giving you the major names and dates in the lectures and in the notes. Don't try to memorize 3,000 names. And there's no point. <laughs> but the point of reading this book was to get an overview of all the Crusades and also to get some kind of a theoretical context in which to view the whole phenomenon of the Crusades. And last week, I, I gave you some views that were really, I had taken from my favorite um, crusade historian, uh, Jonathan Riley Smith. And this book, uh, my graduate students voted it was too hard for undergraduates. And, <laughs> and I'm sort of using this as my guide. And uh, it's, it's just chock full of names and dates and events. And, and it's very, very detailed. And the graduate students thought it was too hard. This book refutes Jonathan Riley Smith. Uh, did any of you catch how he's refuting Jonathan Riley Smith? I, um, it's easier if you read Jonathan first, but any of you catch what it was? Don't forget the mic. <laughs> what is he so against? What, what was the main point he made that he was so much refuting in his, in his argument? What was he refuting here? Anybody, anybody managed to get, well, maybe we were more attuned to it because we had just read Jonathan Riley Smith in the graduate class. He's arguing against uh, the Crusades as a movement. He says, uh, he says they're not a movement. They are rather something else. Uh, what does he say they are? Anybody, was anybody able to ferret out the thesis of this book? What, what would you say is the thesis of this book? What is he trying to prove in this book? This was a tough book. <laughs> OK, let me see if I can find that thesis real fast. I actually underlined it. Um, Okay. The argument of this book is that such uncertainty was endemic, endemic because the crusade as an institution only, only existed as an expression of desires and policies to which holy wars were useful but tangential. The ecclesiastical and political ambitions of popes, the devotional practices of the laity, especially the nobility, the development of the cult of chivalry and a code of aristocratic self-esteem and honor, the economic expansion of parts of Western Europe, the religious initiatives of church reformers. The Crusades were their creation, not vice versa. In other words, he's arguing against the Crusades as a major shaping phenomenon of Europe. And he's saying instead that the Crusades were an invention of a culture that was already there in Europe. That, and that there was interaction, you know, as Europe developed certain elements of it, the Crusades developed along those same lines. And that's kind of what he was arguing there. Did you have a comment? I'm sorry. I just wondered what page you were reading that from. Oh, I'm in the introduction on page four and five, and it's sort of at the bottom of four and going on to five. And, and that seems to me um, uh, to be the thesis of this book. And he continues, it was no coincidence that crusading was a product not of the frontier with Islam, but of the heartlands of Christendom. So he's saying the invention of the crusade was made by the particular aspects of the society and the crusade was shaped to serve those particular needs, the needs of the papacy, the needs of the nobility, uh, the needs of intellectuals within that society, and not the other way around. The crusades did not shape, shape these people. And I, I want to sort of enter into a little bit of philosophical um, speculation here as well. Um, I made the comment uh, last week when in the graduate seminar we read uh, Jonathan Riley Smith's uh, short history of the Crusades 
that it's been my observation that all these historians of the Crusades are totally steeped in Crusade history. They know everything about the Crusades and what happened in the Holy Land and how the Crusades were organized and they, you know, the journeys that go there and what they did when they got to the Holy Land. What they don't know is what was happening in Europe. <laughs> and, so, and so really this book, Christopher Tyreman, kind of, you know, corrects that problem among Crusader historians because he is very aware, most of the book, most of the evidence for this book is from within Europe and within the European culture. And the other observation that seemed relevant to me about this book was the nature of his evidence that he was using in order to prove his thesis that, it, that the Crusades were a product of the development of European culture. It seems to me that he was doing a very modern thing in not really looking a lot at the nobles, but trying to look at ordinary people and, and not looking, he did look at intellectuals and kings and, and some, but he spent a lot of time looking at what ordinary people thought and, and he was taking that as his, as his evidence. And so I think that was a very modern way to approach this. Um, often you might wonder, what is the function of historians? I mean, why not just write history and have it forever? Um, and, and the answer is, each generation reinterprets history according to the, the milieu, the, the culture of each generation and so it gets reinterpreted and that's what historians do. They, they reinterpret the history in terms of their own culture that they live in. Um, okay, um, I think this, this book was kind of useful to you in that it gave you an overview of the entire crusading experience. The other, the other grounds on which he refuted Jonathan Riley Smith was Jonathan Riley Smith, as I told you last time, wants to carry the Crusades up to um, the French Revolution. 1789 is when he ends the Crusading movement. Well, Tyreman uh, refutes that too. He says that's absurd. He says they end when uh, Acre falls in 1291 and that's the end of the Crusades. So here we're right in the midst of debates among historians about you know what is really happening here and what's going on. And I think this will help you as we now delve into each of the individual Crusades and look at how each one of them developed. Um, one of the other points he made in this book is there was no name for the Crusades. I mean, nobody called it the First Crusade. He even argues that, you know, there are no Crusades in the 12th century. He says there are no Crusades in the 12th century. Why? They didn't have a name for them, and he keeps arguing they never had a name for them. Um, he, he really, what is the point where he says the Crusades start to exist? Um, the way I read it, it's uh, uh, when uh, Pope Innocent III, yeah, when Innocent III uh, re uh, redefined what uh, what we normally would consider the Crusades, when um, you know, as opposed to the way uh, you know, it's supposed to be, yeah. instead of it being a call to arms like the way Urban II uh, um, uh, called for the First Crusade, um, yeah. <coughs> um, Innocent III uh, describes it as. Uh, Trying to think of the word is not coming to me right now. Yeah, well, he has lots of words that I mean. They call themselves uh, cruces signators or something. I keep forgetting what that name is. It's, I've got it underlined somewhere. Um, Cruzers, and, and and they call themselves different names, but they never really sort of use the word crusade. And and they often call it holy war, and often they're uh, they're attaching it to the holy land. Uh, which they look at as the real crusade, the really important one is to the Holy Land. And, they, and, and the crazy thing is, you know, all the crusades to the Holy Land failed, except the first one. And the successful crusades were in Spain and in the Baltic and, <laughs> and in Italy. And the crusades in Europe were the really successful ones, but they don't sort of want to look at those as crusades. Um, but uh, uh, some, his, some modern historians don't want to consider those crusades. I, personally, I think they are. As you see, I have included them in the course. Uh, 
uh, he also, he kind of thinks the Third Crusade is the shaper, though, I mean, he says the Third Crusade is the one where people suddenly realize that they've got a phenomenon going on. Uh, because when the First Crusade happened, of course, and they conquered the Holy Land, and they never thought they were going to have another um, pilgrimage to the Holy Land, an armed pilgrimage, because they conquered it, you know, why, why would they need another one? And, and, and then, what triggered the Second Crusade? Were any of, you, any of you get that? I believe it was the fall of Edessa. When Edessa fell, and this is about 1048. Um, there, were, there were increasing, uh, there were waves of people who went to the Holy Land after the First Crusade, but, but we really don't have the Second Crusade until an event happens to trigger it. And this is 1148 with the Second Crusade, the fall of Edessa, and then St. Bernard starts preaching another crusade. And each of those crusades are triggered by something. Okay. What, and the Battle of Hattin is the one that uh, uh, triggers the Third Crusade. And so then the, all the kings get together and they call a crusade for the Third Crusade. Richard Lionheart and Philip Augustus and, and Frederick Barbarossa, the kings of Europe. That's when everything changes. And with Innocent III, he starts calling the Crusades, not as a reaction to something that happened, but because he wants to accomplish something in particular. And that, to me, seems like a really big turning point in, in, in what you want to call the development of the Crusades. I think that, that Innocent III recognized that they were doing something you know, that they were sending these endeavors. And remember that Innocent III called five crusades, okay? And he called them not only against the Holy Land, two against the Holy Land, one against the Albigensians, one against the Spaniards, one against or the Muslims in Spain, one against the Baltics in the north, and another one uh, against the, um, uh, someone in Italy, uh, one of his political enemies. So he not only changes the whole idea of the crusade, he almost invents it in a way you could argue that Innocent invents the crusades. Okay, I told you I expected this book to do something different than it actually did. And um, because crusade historians are so immersed in the crusades themselves, they don't often go backward in time to look at what happened before the crusades. And as a historian in my own research area, I do Europe uh, more than the Crusades. I tend to look at internal events in Europe as uh, the causes of the Crusades, and there are some historians who, who agree with me on that. So let's take a look again, and last week I, I gave you some ideas about uh, what, what kinds of things were going on in Europe, and I want to kind of continue and develop that a little bit more in the first lecture tonight. Okay, so now we're going to start Lecture 3, The Origins of the Crusades. And the first thing we have to look at is the idea of crusading did not just pop into Pope Urban's head overnight. He didn't just suddenly decide, oh, I'm going to call a crusade. This is a wonderful thing to do. Uh, what are the traditional, um, the traditional uh, events that usually are thought of as, as triggering the First Crusade? You know, any of you remember? Did you, were you able to glean it out of the reading? One particular event is always cited as, the, as what triggers. Yeah. I would have to say the Fall of Jerusalem. Uh, the Fall of Jerusalem? Uh, no, the First Crusade. At the First Crusade, Jerusalem was already in Muslim hands. Okay. And anybody have an idea? Yeah. I would say probably to, to protect uh, pilgrims on their way to the Holy Land. Yeah. Oh, okay. Why would pilgrims need protection? What what event happened that that caused pilgrims to need protection? Yeah. Was it the invasion of the Turks? Yes, the invasion of the Turks, and one particular battle is always cited. Anybody know the name of that battle? Okay, it's the Battle of Manzikert, and it happens in uh, 1071. Okay. 
And at that point, the Byzantine forces are defeated, and the Byzantines actually lose Asia Minor. Okay, and so that is usually cited as this is the triggering event. The Byzantines then send to the West and say, "Help, help! Come and rescue us, um, uh, Byzant. Uh, we're we're losing our land. The Turks are taking over." and Urban is said to have responded. Okay, but it's much more complicated than that. You have to go back and look at a lot of other things that are going on at the same time. And here are some pictures. Here is Urban preaching the First Crusade, and, and here is the response, God wills it. Uh, and this is, this is not a real picture. It's just a drawing, a very fanciful drawing of it. Okay. We looked at some preconditions to the crusade last time. We looked at the peace and prosperity, which happened in the year 1000 when the Viking invasions all stopped. And um, uh, Europe was no longer being invaded. And so they began to develop uh, economically and politically and uh, really building a new society. Also, we have a militaristic society that exists anyway. I mean, it's a militaristic society. It's all based on military institutions. Another precondition to the crusade is the infusion of new cultures at that time. The Vikings don't disappear. They become a part of Europe. They convert to Christianity. They build governments in Scandinavia, in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. A lot of them are settled in, in Normandy, and they become the Normans, and those are the ones that conquer England and conquer Italy and Sicily and infuse more militarism into that society as well. The Vikings are also trading, a trading culture. They're very much into commerce, and so they infuse that into the new culture. The Magyars convert to Christianity, and they adopt Christian institutions, and they become the country of Hungary, okay? And they develop the eastern frontier. So that we have this opening up of new frontiers, both in the north and in the east. Another of the preconditions is the reform movement within the church, and we'll get into some more detail of that because it's very important what's going on in the church and triggering the First Crusade. And also turmoil in the East, and, and by the East I mean the Middle East and the Holy Land with the Turks coming in. Okay, that kind of turmoil. With the peace and the new prosperity, we have the end of the Viking and Magyar and Saracen invasions and the beginning of a new age of prosperity. And you remember that we have this technological revolution with the water mill, the heavy plow, and the windmill that come in that, that make it a, a kind of machine society uh, because the water mill functions very much as uh, steam power does in the Industrial Revolution. And one author has called this the Industrial Revolution of the Middle Ages. And this triggers surpluses. They're producing a lot more and, this me and their diet is better and so the population rises. Um, there's a relative end of violence, at least it's beginning to end, and it's becoming much more formalized. Instead of being raw barbarian warfare, it's becoming, it's becoming almost a ritual to go through, a warlike ritual, rather than, you know, just kill everybody. Warfare was no longer endemic. It was sporadic, just happening in, in one place or another. And part of the material evidence of all this peace and prosperity and, and uh, end of warfare is the building of churches and the growth of towns everywhere that's going on. Here we have some marauding expeditions of the Northmen. And again, this is very romantic. These aren't real pictures. They're just 19th century imagination. And here are the Normans, um, or, or the Northmen, the Vikings, sailing up the Seine River uh, to attack Paris. And again, this is an imagined scene uh, of what really happened. But here is the heavy plow, and so we can see this plow and the plowing of the fields, which is um, a real development. This is from a medieval manuscript. And here's a drawing of the kind of manners that they would have had uh, um, here is the rotation of the fields a, uh, that they would rotate. Uh, I, I described the three-field rotation to you and the, and the strips that different uh, peasants would own and the, the demean would be the manor house. This is the kind of um, um, village 
that you would find clustered around a manor house and uh, um, a more elaborate form of this would grow into a town around a castle or a monastery. But this is a manor house. It's the economic unit of the Middle Ages. Okay, and, and the peace uh, meant that we could have nobles as well as peasants having a more relaxed life. This is the wa another drawing of that water wheel, and, and it's a very powerful engine that can really drive machines uh, to, to power this industrial revolution. Here's a picture of a functioning water wheel that I took when I was in Denmark last year. And, and, and just, I mean, I can't even describe to you the roar and the power of that water that the water mill is, is producing, the, the actual power that's being done. And here is one of the uses that they can put to it. Here is that water wheel, and it's, it's being used as a chain pump. Okay, so it can, it can perform all kinds of work. And here is a, another part of that industrial uh, revolution of the Middle Ages is the invention of hard liquor um, spirits. And so here is a distilling operation that they invented. It was the actual monks who invented um, uh, uh, hard liquor, and that's why so many of the liqueurs are named after monasteries like Chartreuse, for example, and um, uh, Benedictine, uh, and so they, that's what they invented as part of this. Okay, here is the countryside with the peasants shearing their sheep, and the building of towns. This is a very important town in, the, in southern France, uh, Carcassonne, which is a really large city, and this is a wonderful city that still exists in southern France. You can go there and visit it. It's a very beautiful city. And then we have this explosion of building. I, I showed you some pictures last week. These are some different um, churches that were built in different parts of France. And this here is one in Germany. And these are Romanesque churches built in the 11th century. And the interesting thing about them is they're all different. They're experimenting with different styles. It's a very experimental age. And then we have the opening of marble quarries. This is a marble quarry uh, to quarry the stone in order to build these churches. And so we have an explosion of, of um, uh, uh, businesses and commerce in the area so that you know one thing triggers another. It's an economic takeoff that's happening. Well, we have a militaristic society. We have the birth of feudalism and the, in the anarchy of the barbarian invasion. What happened in the birth of feudalism was central government, such as Charlemagne's empire, broke down. And so all government um, broke down to a local level. And you have the development of lords and vassals uh, to protect from the invasion and the warfare on a local level. The, the lord was usually a military commander in the area, and the vassals were men who served in his army. I'm oversimplifying it a little bit. And as I said last time, they signed, or I wouldn't say you signed, but they, they were oral contracts, reciprocal contracts, where each would agree to do things for the other. The Lord uh, agreed to protect the vassal. The vassal agreed to fight in the Lord's army. Uh, the, uh, the, I, I'm, I'm focusing on some important things here. The Lord agreed to listen to the advice of his uh, vassal, and the vassal agreed to give counsel to the Lord. Um, it, it's almost a quasi-democratic society where everybody participates, and the Lord needs his vassals in order to, he needs their input and their advice. And he doesn't take a major decision before he actually consults them. And you'll see as you read the Chronicle of the First Crusade, all these lords consulting with each other and, and, and discussing things and coming to agreement uh, over things. You know, this is the feudal system in operation. Private control replaces public control, especially in France, and the castle is the focus of it. It's the symbol of private local control. Uh, it's based on a system of mounted shock combat. Uh, but but they don't often have battles. They really they really tend to um, uh, 
besiege cities rather than have open combat. Justice is local and justice is rendered not by the state but by the local baron's court. And so it's private, it's in private hands. So here's a fortress in the late 12th century being besieged and, and as you can see they're, they're, the besiegers are not mounted, they're on foot. So sometimes they would fight on foot. Here, are, here is the quintessential feudal um, army, the Normans, as they go into the Norman conquest to conquer England. And they were not only in England where they made conquest, they were also in southern Italy, uh, which they conquered at the same time. That's the other conquest that nobody knows about, that the Normans conquered uh, southern Italy and Sicily. So here are the Normans engaging in the Battle of Hastings and in mounted shock warriors. And here is a castle, a feudal castle. This is a Norman one at the city of Rouen. Um, and uh, it's stone. The original ones, of course, were wooden. Um, they only started building stone after they, after the Normans had the wealth of England at their command. And here's the most famous castle of them all, the Tower of London, which William the Conqueror built uh, when he first came to England. Okay, and here is a scene at a court, the court of a lord. Here would be the lord, and here would be all his vassals. Now, one thing we have to note is vassals are not just soldiers, but also here we have the soldiers who would be the vassals over here, and on this side we have bishops and we have clerics and monks, and so that a lord would have control when feudalism first started out. You know, the Lord would have abbots of monasteries as his vassals. He would have bishops as his vassals. He would have priests as his vassals. And these, these monasteries and these bishops would have to supply soldiers to his army. And so what happened was, as feudalism arose, the church became very secularized, and the secular lords got a lot of local control over the churches, just as they got control over justice. And so, you know, you can inevitably predict that certain churchmen were going to object to that and say, this is wrong, laymen should not control the church, and that there would be reform movements to purify the church and make it go back to the way it was before feudalism arose. And that's exactly what happened. The, 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 what caused the reform movements to arise was exactly that, the secularization of the church. And certain churchmen ro arose to object. Well, was society as violent as tradition suggests? And the answer is yes and no. There were cases of vendetta. A vendetta would be like a blood feud, and that, that's a kind of hangover from the old early Germanic times when if your brother was killed, then you went and killed the murderer of your brother. It was a family thing. Um, uh, actually, Jonathan Riley Smith thinks of the crusade as a kind of vendetta, and he's absolutely wrong because that is all out of date. By the time of the first crusade, Vendettas are gone out of style. Nobody's doing that anymore. That's old-fashioned barbarian stuff, and these people have gone beyond it. I mean, they're not doing vendettas anymore. And so, and so, you know, sometimes there would be family feuds, but they weren't the kind of formal legal vendettas that you find in the very early Germanic law codes. Yet there was a lot of ordering going on. Germany was unified and centralized under the Ottonians, and we had a period of Otto I, Otto II, and Otto III were the ones who stopped the Magyar invasions. And so they started unifying Germany, and we have the Ottonian Renaissance, which was an intellectual revival. Able administrators arose. Otto II actually married a Byzantine princess and brought in a lot of the ideas of the Byzantine Empire plus a lot of intellectuals from the Byzantine Empire. And so there were these administrators who were, who were learning from the Byzantines and Byzantine scholars at the royal court. Here is a picture of, this is Otto III, um, and he is, has the appearance of a Byzantine ruler, in fact, but this is pure early medieval. Here he is sitting on the throne with the orb, orb of the world and the scepter with his um, uh, churchmen by his side and his military men at his other side. And the other half of this picture is 
this one where he is proclaiming himself Holy Roman Emperor. I mean, uh, you all know Voltaire's comment that the Holy Roman Emperor is neither holy nor Roman nor an emperor. But in any case, in theory, that's what he wanted to be. And he, he, uh, they didn't call themselves Holy Roman Emperors until the 12th century, but the concept is there. And if you look at this picture carefully, you can see the subject com countries coming to do homage to the Emperor Otto III, and he thought of himself as an emperor. Can you read any of the Latin uh, over these labels, over these names? Can any of you read those? Are they too hard to read on the screen? What is this one? You can tell what that one is. Rome, Rome, yes, that's Rome. So Rome is, is doing homage uh, to the emperor and obedience to the emperor. What is this one? Anyone can tell? What is it? Gaul. Gaul, Gaul, France. Gallia is Gaul or France. How about this one? Germania, this is Germany. And how about this one? This is the hardest one. S-C-L-A-V-I-N-I-A. -I -I Slovenia, the Slavs, okay, the Slavs, who have now converted to Christianity. He's really talking about sort of Bohemia is what they call it, Poland, Czechoslovakia, that area, has converted to Christianity under the Ottonians, who are the emperors who become their lords. And, and, and the emperor is seeing himself as the ultimate lord, and all these countries are his vassals, okay? Notice that no pope is in there, in that scheme of things. <laughs> and so if the pope is in there, we'll go back to this one, if the pope is in there, he's over here with the churchmen. He's not, um, he's not part of that scheme. I mean, the, the uh, absolute ruler is the emperor here. And this was another thing that people started objecting to, churchmen started objecting to. Did you have a comment? Uh, which Otto was the first to declare himself Holy Roman Emperor? Uh, the term Holy Roman Emperor wasn't used until the 12th century, but it really happens with Otto I. And in fact, it was the Pope who crowned him Emperor. Uh, uh, but we have to go back to Charlemagne. Charlemagne is the first medieval emperor, and so the crowning of Charlemagne as emperor was the the beginning of this whole tradition of having a medieval emperor. Uh, the Ottonians were um, uh, thought of themselves as the heirs of Charlemagne, and they, they thought of themselves as descended from Charlemagne's rule and taking their rule from, from Charlemagne as heirs. Okay. Now, uh, here, here are some examples of, of people that are at the court. Roswintha of Gandersham, who is a woman who is a poet and a playwright. She was at the Ottonian court. One of the most important people was Pope Sylvester II, who's also called Gerber or Gerber of Aurillac. Uh, he studied Islamic science and math in Spain. He, was, he wrote a whole bunch of textbooks on mathematics. He introduced Arabic numerals to a select few within the empire, and he had an encyclopedic uh, classical knowledge. He was a very learned man, and there are important ways in which he foreshadowed the reformed papacy because he tried very hard to restore the church to a condition in which the church was important. At the time of Sylvester II, the popes were absolutely powerless. I mean, they were just minions of the people of Rome. They were elected by the mobs at Rome, and uh, uh, the, the, the different noble families of Rome had control of who got elected pope. And in fact, Pope Sylvester was French, and, and he was a sort of reformer who came in at the emperor's behest. The, the emperor, um, really, the emperor Otto II, uh, brought him in, and he protected Otto III as a baby, um, and and the the women who who were his um, uh, protectors in the church, and and so uh, Pope Sylvester II really foreshadowed the reformers in important ways. So Germany was unified, and England was unified and centralized too. Under, interestingly, the Norwegian Vikings, uh, King Canute 
was a Viking who actually conquered England and made himself king of England. And he unified England really for the first time. Um, often it's said that Alfred unified England, but he really didn't. Uh, it was only under Canute that all of England was under one rule with, with a sort of iron rule. And he saw the necessity of unifying it to impose English customs. Whenever you have a conqueror, he tends to unify and centralize things because he tends to impose a unified set of rules on everybody. And this is what Canute did. We see centralizing and regularizing of the rule. When Canute conquered, he was a pagan, but he converted to Christianity because England's kings were always Christian. And so he became a Christian, yeah. When was Sylvester Pope? Uh, the easy way to remember is around the year 1000. I think he died in 1002, but he was Pope. He was only Pope for a few years, but in the year 1000 he was actually, you can remember him that way as a kind of shorthand. And this is, a, uh, this is uh, Canute was actually King of England in 1016, so shortly after that Canute comes and so he has this centralizing, regularizing rule of Europe. He becomes a Christian. Interestingly, he, he already had a, a um, uh, Danish wife and he kept her, but he also married a Christian wife. <laughs> and he kept her too. Yeah. Uh, is this is this after the Norman conquest of England? No, no, this no, no. Before? This is before. This is before the Norman con. When was the Norman conquest? Anybody know? 1066. 1066. Right. Yeah. So this is Canute is 1016. So he's a conqueror before the Normans conquer England. Yeah. This is a little offhand, but um, doesn't Canute use the like the institutions that Alfred had already established as king when he like? I mean. When yes. He, dominates and that's why he is able to rule so effectively being the conqueror. Yes, he did. He, he saw himself as the inheritor of the kingship of Alfred and he saw himself as carrying on English kingship in the English tradition and so that's why he became a Christian and married a Christian wife. The wife he married was the wife of the former king who had just died and this was Ethelred and he married Emma of Normandy, who was uh, the queen. And so she became his queen too, but she was a really hard driving woman who made a hard deal. And the deal was, uh, he already had children by that first Danish wife. And so her deal was her children by him would inherit, not her, her predecessors. <laughs> and, so, and so interestingly, the Danish wife went home to Norway and she was queen of Norway and she ruled Norway and Emma was queen of England and they were both married to Canute. So how Christian was that? Well, <laughs> Canute also went on a pilgrimage to Rome and he went to Rome partly as a religious conviction but also partly to see the Pope crown um, uh, one of the Ottos uh, uh, emperor. And so he was uh, participating in international European politics. And so you see how the Vikings are converting and they're, they're getting involved. They're becoming part of, of the uh, diplomacy and the, and the negotiations among the rulers of Europe. So they're becoming part of it so that uh, they're unifying. Well, this is St. This is Radegund. Uh, she's a German woman uh, of the 12th century, a woman uh, uh, saint. So she's sort of like Roswintha. I put her there to remind you. And here is the Holy Roman Empire, which uh, was unified under the Ottos, and so we can see it all colored here with these particular colors that, uh, but, uh, but it also retains its heritage of the tribal duchies. And so that was going to cause trouble later on, uh, the idea that the tribal duchies are there in Germany. This is Germany. And it included Italy at this, under the autos. Okay, here's the baptism of St. Stephen by Pope, Pope Sylvester II. St. Stephen was uh, from Hungary. And so this sort of symbolizes the inclusion of Hungary into the European world, those Eastern countries that are becoming part of it. And we're also having the spread eastward, the clearing of those lands. Remember that we have the clearing of the lands with the heavy plow. 
and this shows the movement, the colonization of the eastern frontier. Uh, the Bohemians are becoming Christians, the Slavs, the Hungarians, the Poles. Later on, the Prussians are going to be converted by the Baltic Crusades, and, and this area is where the Baltic Crusades take place, really up through here. But, but this is the Slavic Eastern Europe that's being incorporated into Europe at this time. Here is King Canute rebuking his courtiers. I think that actually they have the title wrong. This is a, another 19th century fanciful picture. I think it's Canute commanding the tide to stop coming in. There's that story about him uh, giving this futile command to tell that he thought he was so powerful that he could command the tide to stop coming in. And here is Canute's empire. The thing about Canute's empire that um, is really interesting is it's a North Sea empire. Here he has Norway. He ruled Norway, Denmark, at parts of Sweden and England. So it looks like in this period of Canute that um, England is going to be a North Sea empire. It's only when the Normans conquer it that it's going to turn its face more toward uh, Europe and it's back to the Scandinavian world. But England, with Canute's conquest, is part of the Scandinavian world. Okay, uh, as I said, Canute made a pilgrimage to Rome to vindicate his rule and his reorganization of England. And at the same time that the Vikings were organizing England, Normandy was organizing and centralize, centralizing. The Vikings were expanding and organizing the government of Normandy and it was being transformed from a county to a duchy. Uh, actually, when the Normans first, the Vikings first settled in Normandy, they just settled around the city of Rouen, and then they just conquered everybody around them till they got the whole duchy. Uh, the original uh, uh, Viking in control was Rollo, who was Count of Rouen, and let me, let me write that down. Rouen is a city on the Seine River. And uh, as time went by, uh, his sons then started calling themselves dukes and uh, then uh, getting, making their brothers um, uh, counts. And so they were elaborating and systematizing the government, making a hierarchy with the duke at the top and then the counts underneath the duke and the vicomts under the under under the counts and the bishops under the under the counts and we have a conversion and reform um, education arrives in Normandy and it arrives interestingly with a, a native convert Erlewan and this is Erlewan right here who founds the Abbey of Beck and it's a, it's, a, it's a new foundation. It's not an old foundation, but it becomes the most powerful abbey in all of Normandy. It's a native conversion to Christianity, but it's helped along by Lanfranc, who actually comes from Italy. Okay, And he then brings education, and, and the, the primary chronicler of, of Normandy says, it's Lanfranc who brings education. He founds a school at the Abbey of Beck, and everybody flocks to it. Laymen come, and we don't know who those laymen were, but I, I argued in one article that um, uh, I think they were the, the nobles at the court of William the Conqueror who went to Beck, uh, the sons of these nobles who got their education at Beck, because they're the ones who are giving land to Beck. And at the very same time that Normandy is organizing and becoming very complex in a very, a very organized way and is developing its religion and the monasteries and the educational system of Normandy, other Normans are going to southern Italy and to Spain where they're conquering lands and uh, uh, conquering the whole territory of those areas. And I'm going to show you some maps at this point. Here are some Normans. Uh, this is again from the Bio Tapestry where they're fighting the Battle of Hastings and you can see their classic mounted knights here. And here is the Duchy of Normandy which is this area right up here 
and it's just above the territory that the, the King of France actually ruled a smaller area than Normandy, right to the south of Normandy here where Paris is today. But Normandy became the foremost uh, county of the area. And here you can see in this map, which we might want to move just a little bit here, this is the area that the Normans conquered in 1066. Here's Normandy, they conquered all of England. And here is the area that they conquered in southern Italy and Sicily. And so we've got two big Norman states which are very well organized and, and uh, some of the foremost states in Europe at the time. Flanders was also precocious in its organization and it, it, it took part in the trade networks of the North Sea, and Flanders was very precocious in the growth of cities. Has anybody been to Flanders? What, what, what are the modern countries of Flanders? Anybody know what they are? Uh, yeah. Belgium and uh, Netherlands. Right. Belgium, the Netherlands, Holland. Uh, that's where Flanders is. What is that land like? Does anybody know the topography and what it's like? Yeah. It's very flat. It's very flat. What else? It's also very low. Very low. What it was at the time uh, of the Middle Ages in the early 11th century, it was a swamp. Okay, that's why the Dutch built those dikes in order to hold the sea out because they, they, they were draining the swamps. Okay, it was a swamp. It was, it was not good land to grow things on. It was not good land to develop. And so they built cities and they built commercial centers. And what they did was hook into those trade networks that the Vikings had in the North Sea. And they became the most prosperous and the best organized uh, county in all of Europe. Uh, and, and so Normandy and Flanders were really incredibly well organized in, in, on the North Sea in, in hooking into those trading networks. Tuscany was also organized and centralized under uh, the countesses or duchesses Beatrice and Matilda. And uh, it was intertwined by marriage with Upper Lorraine and Lower Lorraine. And let me show you where those areas are. Here are the trade networks in the North Sea. Here, hooking in to, this is Flanders right here. Ghent, Antwerp, Bruges, Ypres, all of this is Flanders. And they're hooking into these North Sea trading networks. And here is London, which is also part of that. Boulogne is part of Flanders. And here is Tuscany down here, which is at the other side of these trade networks that go overland across Europe. Okay, And here we can see in this map, where you can see these countries. Here is England and Normandy, the, the Anglo-Norman Empire. Here is Flanders in the yellow, and this is Upper Lorraine and Lower Lorraine. Tuscany is down here, and we have an important marriage alliance that hooks these two together. And, and Beatrice and Matilda, married to Godfrey of Lower Lorraine, become the foremost challengers of the emperor. They become the largest er territory of Germany that can confront the emperor. And then here is Italy and Sicily down here, uh, that, that uh, Italian, I mean that Norman network. Here you can see it a little bit better on this map. Um, here is Normandy and here is Flanders over here. And this is labeled Lotharingia is another name for Lorraine, but um, upper Lorraine and Lower Lorraine, right in here. And there's Flanders across here and Normandy across there. Okay, this is a neat map. I just found it this afternoon. <laughs> okay, this is, the, this is uh, Matilda of Tuscany and she was very important. I'm going to mention her again. I'll come back to her because her role was to be the foremost supporter of the popes, the reform popes who arose to challenge the lay dominance of this area, and she was their major supporter. There was creeping lay control over the church, as I mentioned before. Lay abbots and advocates uh, um, took charge of the monasteries and, and, and really sort of looted them of their goods and their, and their 
uh, and their incomes. Uh, there was incorporation of the bishoprics into the lay aristocracy, and a, a sort of illustration of this is uh, uh, the, the Dukes of Normandy. Often they appointed their brothers or their nephews or their cousins as counts in Normandy and also as bishops and archbishops. And so, I mean, they were sort of interchangeable. And an archbishop had manners and property that equaled what a count would have. I mean, an archbishop or a bishop was very rich. And so, and so you could become, and, and half of them were married. Uh, because um, you know, they because the Normans were new converts. They didn't understand the church, and so they they married, and then they passed their their land down their archbishopric or their bishopric on to their children. And so you can see how this creeping lay control of the church would offend churchmen, um, devout churchmen. Uh, and, and there was more than just giving of offices. There was sometimes people would buy their offices and their prelacies and their prebends. And do you know what that's called in the church when, when um, with the buying and selling of offices? Do you know what that's called? You've got it, yeah. Simony, right, it's called simony. But what this was happening was the incorporation of bishoprics and abbeys and church offices into the feudal system. And the churches were becoming vassals to lay and ecclesiastical lords. Okay, here is a bishop ordaining a priest. And that's the way the church wanted it to be done, you know, the bishop ordaining the priest. But uh, really, so sometimes the count or the duke would ordain the priest. How was warfare carried out? Well, seldom were there pitched battles. Ambushes were common, particularly of travelers. But sieges were the rule. Usually they blockaded a castle and besieged it to capture a castle or a city. When there were battles, the aim was to capture and ransom and not to kill them. Okay. And here is uh, uh, feudal Europe. I don't know why I have this map right here, but here is Flanders again. And this is the territory. Why, why do I have this? Oh, this is the territory of uh, monastic reform. Um, I think I put it in. Uh, okay, this map belongs next. I'll come back to it. Cluniac reform was one of the protests against this, this secularization of the church. The Cluniacs were the first to protest against this. Uh, they were a monastery in Burgundy, and let me show you that map. This is Burgundy right here, and Cluny is right along in here. And Cluny is right about in there. And, uh, 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 William the Ninth of Aquitaine founded Cluny and granted it freedom from any lay control. They were only to be subject to the popes in Rome, and so that was the only person they had to answer to. Okay, uh, William of Aquitaine and King Henry the Third of Germany protected the Cluniacs, and the Abbey of Cluny had this wonderful freedom from any control, and so. It then reformed a lot of other houses and founded a lot of other houses so that it became a mother house with lots of daughter houses. And so it had hundreds and hundreds of daughter houses all throughout Europe latching onto this reform. And it was the head of a major network all over Europe, which gave it a lot of power automatically. You can see how much power it would have. And so Cluny is the origin of the monastic corporation. The reason was all these monasteries wanted to escape from local lay and ecclesiastical control. And so liberties were one thing, but they also reformed the liturgy and they went back to austerity, the austerity of the original uh, uh, early church was what they aimed for. The consequences were the burgeoning growth of the Cluniac order and the zeal to reform on the part of both the clergy and the laity. And this urge to reform spread to the papacy. 
The origins of papal reform were with the Emperor Henry III of Germany. Uh, remember that Cluny uh, could, had to answer only to the Pope, but the Pope had to answer to the Emperor. The Emperor was appointing Popes at this time. And uh, the Emperor was the one who took the lead in reforming the Church because Henry III got fed up with a bunch of corrupt popes um, and appointed a new reforming pope, Pope Leo IX, who was a Cluniac in 1049. And Leo IX was the beginning of what is called the moderate reform papacy. He ruled from 1049 to 1054. And when he became pope, when Henry III actually appointed him, there had been a string of popes who had gotten the papacy by nefarious means and then suddenly died mysteriously. Some of them were murdered. Okay, so I mean the papacy was really falling into rack and ruin. Do you have a comment? Actually, was it, wasn't there a time when there was two popes that were... Um... Oh, that was later. That was late, but but the, at this time there'll be two popes, and and we'll come to that in just a moment. Yeah, but but now Henry is appointing Leo because there's this just terrible corruption among the papacy. Uh, Leo's real name was Bruno of Toul, and he sort of almost forced Henry to appoint him. When you read those primary sources, those chronicles. Uh, you can see that Henry, it's not totally Henry's idea, but Leo is, is helping Henry to appoint him in important ways, like forcing him to appoint. And then, and then he claims to be reluctant to accept because, you know, a, a good churchman should not desire high office, but rather he should, you know, uh, he should be forced into the office. And so Henry kind of forces, uh, Henry forces him to become pope. And he only acquiesced on the acclamation of the people of Rome. So he, he, he kept saying, oh, no, I don't want to be pope. And Henry was saying, yes, you have to. So he goes to Rome and all the people crowd into the streets and proclaim him pope and say, yes, you are the pope. So, so then he becomes pope. And Leo IX begins a program of what we call moderate reform. And he is just on the most basic level. He says, all right, clerics, monks and bishops and, and archbishops and abbots have to be celibate. They can't get married. And so it's on the very, you know, most basic kind of reform. He, he preaches against simony, the buying and selling of offices, which we've already mentioned. Here is the Emperor Henry II, who is actually the father of Henry III. But you can see, uh, what, what is the symbolism in this picture? What, can you see this symbolism here? It's, gonna, it, it, it's going to contribute to what we're going to talk about in just a moment. Can you see the symbolism of this picture? What, what have you got there? Yeah. Looks like a trinity. Yeah, sort of, but he's got, he's got saints on either side of him holding up his arms. He's holding up the rod of rule and the sword. Who's crowning him emperor? Divine right of God. Divine right of kings. God, God, is, up, God is crowning him emperor, right? That's where he gets his power to be emperor. God gives it to him. Okay, that's what the emperors are going to claim. So, Leo IX is preaching against simony, the buying and selling of offices, and also against lay homage and investiture, the conferring of offices. And he holds synods and councils. He assembles a college of cardinals, and it's the first time we see a college of cardinals there. It's almost a mirror image of the lay lord with his vassals. Um, to advise him. Now we've got the Pope and he's assembling these churchmen there who are his cardinals who are to give him advice and help him rule. It's almost a mirror image of that. And one of the first things he does is to excommunicate the Patriarch of Constantinople. Leo IX also elaborates the administration of the papacy in the same way that the laymen are doing it, like the counts and dukes and, and kings are doing. He appoints papal legates who are, does anybody know what a legate is? 
Anybody know what a leak aid is? Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, aren't they um, the like the uh, representatives of the papacy in foreign countries that have basically the authority of the Pope? Yes. In, okay. Yes, they are. They they're kind of they're, they start out as messengers, but then they have the authority to act as the Pope and to make pronouncements for the Pope. That would extend the papal power to the places where he sends his legates. He also has a system of primacies or primates so that England would have a primate who would be the church, the ruler of the English church who reports back to the papacy. France has two different primates who then are responsible to the papacy. Uh, Spain has a primate. So he's, he's, he's creating a hierarchy and an administration sort of like the Dukes of Normandy were. And so this, these things are happening there as well. Here is a kind of um, uh, symbolic ecclesiastical hierarchy. Here is the Pope as he proclaims it. And here is the emperor ruling sort of side by side with him. And here are all the laymen here. And here are all the churchmen here. And the Pope and the emperor are sort of ruling together. And, and that's what we have going on at this particular time, but that's going to change. There's also the assimilation of new peoples going on. We mentioned that before. Pope Nicholas II is part of those moderate reformers, and what he does is to, to enhance the papacy by getting it an army. And what he does is to sign up the Normans in southern Italy. Okay, the, the Normans in southern Italy have been conquering it. Uh, Robert Guiscard is the leader. Uh, he's one of the 12 sons of Tancred d'Hauteville, and all those 12 sons are building up a, a power in, in southern Italy. In 1059, they sign the Treaty of Melfi. And Pope Nicholas II recognizes Robert as Count of Apulia. Ro Robert has conquered Apulia and calls himself count, but he has no legitimization of his power. The Pope makes him legitimate. His nephew Roger is granted Sicily, which the Muslims hold at that time, and he is given Sicily to conquer. He is, in effect, given a papal banner to conquer Sicily, and he is named as Count of Sicily. In 1060, Robert and Roger begin the conquest of Sicily with the papal blessing, and they are becoming vassals of the pope. The pope has gotten himself an army, and he's become a feudal lord, and the Normans in Italy are his vassals. In 1072, Palermo is conquered, and the Normans have become a papal army. The pope becomes a lord. The Normans are his vassals. Pope Alexander II is also in this line of reformed popes. He is interesting because he was educated at the Abbey of Beck. Remember I was mentioning the Abbey of Beck in Normandy? And he granted William the Bastard, Duke of Normandy, the papal banner to conquer England in 1066. Um, Pope Gregory VII believed that this grant made him William's Lord, but William replied that my predecessors never did homage to your predecessors, and so he sort of scotches Gregory VII's idea. In 1080, with Gregory's backing, Giscard even tried to conquer the Byzantine Empire, and he failed uh, because he had to go back to Rome and protect Gregory, who had been driven out by the uh, by the emperor. By this time, the papacy is beginning to break with the Holy Roman Emperor. Gregory VII is, is called the first of the radical reformers. Um, he rules from uh, 1073 to, uh, I think that date is wrong, I think he rules to 1085, I'm not sure. But Nicholas II, Victor III, and Alexander II had been elected pope with the help of Matilda of Tuscany, and, and she had been their leader against the uh, emperors who claimed the right to um, uh, appoint popes. Gregory now claims uh, uh, Henry IV is a child at this time, 
and Gregory VII claims to have been elected by the College of Cardinals. He is then refuting this claim of the emperors to appoint popes. He is saying, no, emperors cannot appoint popes. Rather, the College of Cardinals will elect them. And here is a here is a, um, an engraving of Pope Gregory VII. It's not that imaginary. It's kind of modeled after a real picture of him. He looks kind of mean, but <laughs> he was a firebrand. He, he claims to be Peter incarnate, to take on the office of St. Peter. And here he is, St. Peter's representative on earth. His goals were to demolish the tradition of lay collaboration and to rebuild society on the pattern of papal monarchy. Gregory VII wanted to create a new world order, an ideal Christian commonwealth with the pope at, his, at its head. Gregory was a firebrand, and he picked an immediate feud with the Emperor Henry IV. He issued something called the Dictatus Papi. That means in Latin, the sayings of the Pope. And he deposes Henry as emperor. He says, it's a long list of rights he says that the Pope has. He says the Pope has the right to depose emperors. The Pope has the right to appoint emperors. The emperor does not have the right to appoint popes. Okay, and he says, here we have his ideal situation. The emperor should kiss the feet of the pope. The pope should never kiss the feet of the emperor. And so he sees himself as a ruler of the entire world and a ruler over the emperors as well. He sees the world in ideal terms as a feudal monarchy as a, and himself as feudal lord of the world. Okay. This doesn't mean he's not religious and sincere in his religion. He thinks that's the way God wants it to be. I mean, he really is religious. Henry, the Emperor Henry IV, declares him a false pope. And then we have that incident at Canossa where, uh, where uh, he's actually, Hen Hen Henry actually goes to the castle of Canossa in January in the middle of winter barefoot in the snow for three days and begs uh, uh, Gregory's forgiveness. And Gregory has to forgive him because he's a penitent sinner. Gregory doesn't want to, but Matilda of Tuscany, who is the lord of that castle at Canosa, says, you have to, you know, he's a penitent Christian. And so Gregory forgives him. And then Henry turns around, he goes back to Germany and reorganizes his country and he appoints an anti-pope and throws Gregory out of Rome. Okay, this is when we have two popes. We have two popes in power. One is a reform pope and one is an imperial pope appointed by the emperor. And nobody at that time knew who was the real pope. I mean, these are two rival popes and nobody knew which line of popes would be the ones that won out and became the legitimate popes. They're having a terrible struggle. Gregory relies on Robert Guiscard and his army to rescue him repeatedly. Gregory corresponds with large numbers of people and actually persuaded the kings of Denmark, Aragon, and Hungary to do homage to him. And this shouldn't surprise you because these are kings of new countries, newly Christian countries, and they need that legitimate backing of the Pope. That's why they do homage to him. But the old kings of France and England and Germany would never do homage to him. The infusions of new peoples aids the radical reformers, and Eastern Europe is newly settled and converted, connected, and it connected East and West. The Scandinavians support the radical reformers to bolster their authority. And the papal legates now supersede the primates. In 1073 to 4, Gregory proposes to lead an armed force to aid the Byzantine emperor and their rises of, rise of thoughts of a new way to gain salvation. That now laymen can gain salvation through arms. That now we have 
the concept of the Miles Christe, the soldier for Christ. And here are these new Eastern kingdoms. There are rise, there's a rise of thoughts of a new way to gain salvation. Um, I'm going to, we're, we're just about out of time for our first lecture. Uh, so I'm going to uh, pick up this line of thought when we come back from our, gra from our break. And we'll talk about the new thoughts of le the legitimacy of warfare and the new heroes that Gregory is conceiving of as these armed knights, as the new Christian heroes. So when we come back from the break, we'll pick up with that. Okay? <laughs>